Part six of Our Little Japanese Cousin by Mary Hazelton Blanchard Wade. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. How many holidays have we in a whole year? Stop and count. Not a great number, we must admit. Lotus Blossom and Toyo have so many that they can count on their fingers the number of days between any two of them. Next best to New Year's. Our little girl cousin likes the feast of dolls. It comes on the third day of the third month. At that time the stores are filled with dolls, big dolls, little dolls, dolls dressed like princesses with flounced silk gowns, dolls made up as servants, as dancing girls, and dolls the very image of the Mikado, the ruler of Japan. Nothing but dolls and dolls' furniture. When the great day arrives, Lotus Blossom's mamma makes a throne in the house. She brings out the two dolls that she herself received when she was born, besides those of her mother and grandmother and great-grandmother. They have been carefully packed away in soft papers in the family storehouse. What a sight they are, with all the new ones that have been bought for Lotus Blossom. The Mikado doll is first placed on his throne, surrounded by his court, and then the soldiers and dancers and working people are made to stand at either side. They are dressed in the proper clothing that belongs to their position. But this grand array is not all. There are all kinds of dolls' furniture, too. Little tables only four inches high with dolls' tea sets, the tiniest, prettiest china dishes. There are the wedded silk quilts for the dolls to sleep on and wooden pillows on which the dolls' heads can rest. Yes, there are dolls' fans, and even dolls' games. On this great occasion, there is a dinner party for the whole family of dolls. Lotus Blossom and her little friends, as well as her father and mother, are quite busy serving their guests with rice, fish, soup, and all kinds of sweet dainties. Somehow or other, all these nice things are eaten. What wonderful dolls they have in Japan, don't they? Toyo enjoys the day as well as Lotus Blossom, but still he is looking forward to the 5th of May. That will be his favorite time of all the year. By that time the girls' dolls will be put away and the stores will be filled with boys' playthings, soldiers, tents, armor, etc. Toyo's father will place a tall bamboo pole in front of the house and hang an immense paper fish on the top of it. The fish's mouth will be wide open, so that the air will fill his big body. At some of the other houses there will be a banner instead of a fish. There are figures of great warriors who fought in old times on these banners. When Toyo was a baby, his father bought him a banner stand. It has been kept very carefully and is now put in the place where the doll's throne stood a little while ago. The banners of great generals are hung up and figures of soldiers are placed on the stand. You see, Toyo has dolls as well as his sister. Everything is done to remind boys of war at this festival of banners. They have processions in the streets. They play a game in which they form armies against each other. Every boy carries a flag, and those of one company try to seize the flags of the boys in the other. Of course, the side wins which first succeeds in gaining the flags of the other. A festival which everybody loves is the Feast of Lanterns. It is in the summer time, and the children are dressed in their gayest clothes. They form processions and march through the streets, singing with all their might. Every child carries a large paper lantern and keeps it swinging all the time. It is such a pretty sight in the evening light. The bright dresses, the graceful figures, the gorgeous lanterns. Oh, Japan is the land of happy children, young and old. One pleasant summer afternoon, as Lotus Blossom and Toyo were playing on their veranda, they noticed someone stopping at the gateway and then coming up the walk to the house. It was the manservant who worked at the home of a friend of theirs whose father was very rich. Toyo whispered, Oh, Lotus Blossom, I believe he's bringing us an invitation to Chrysanthemum's party. You know, She's going to have one on her birthday. Sure enough, the man came up to the children and making a low bow. 
presented them with two daintily folded papers, and then departed. They hastened to open them and found, with delight, that they were really, truly asked to their friend's party. It was to be at three o'clock in the afternoon of the following Thursday. Lotus Blossom ran to her mother, just as her American cousins would do, and cried, Oh, Mama, my precious, honorable mother, what shall I wear? See this? Do look at my invitation. It was a rare thing indeed to see the child so excited. Her mother smiled and answered, My dear little pearl of a lotus blossom, I have almost finished embroidering your new silk garment. It shall be finished, and you shall have a new yellow crepe kerchief to fold about your throat. A barber shall arrange your long hair about your head, and I will buy you white silk sandals to be tied with ribbons. Even though your friend is more wealthy than ourselves, you shall not disgrace your honored father. Though you too must have a new garment. All was made ready, and Thursday came at last. The children were sent to the party in chin rickshaws, so that they should not get dusty. They looked very pretty. The little hostess and her mamma received the guests with smiles and with many long phrases of politeness. Like a tracer brought in and placed in front of each one, on these were beautiful china cups with no handles. What do you think was served in them? Don't get up your hopes now and say lemonade or sherbet, for you will surely be disappointed. It was tea, simply tea, without milk or sugar. The children drank it in honor of the hostess and her mamma, but something better still was to come. The tea was removed and fresh trays covered with dainty pink papers were brought in. A cake made of red beans lay on the middle of each tray, and around it were placed sugar maple leaves colored red and green. They looked pretty enough to keep, but the little guests ate them, leaves and all. After these came other cakes and sweetmeats, enough to delight the heart of everyone. Now for games, proverbs comes first of all. It is played very much like the American game of authors, and is a great favorite with both old and young in Japan. Next comes Blind Man's Buff, but you would hardly know the game. It is played so much more quietly and slowly than you are in the habit of playing it. Wine cakes, dainties, and tea are served next, and then the best part of the fun arrives. The screens are moved aside, and the children behold a little stage. They sit or rather squat, down on the mats about the room where some hired performers represent one of the law fairy stories in a play. The actresses have lovely gowns and are very graceful. It is a very enjoyable occasion. The time to leave comes all too soon. The chin rickshaw men arrive, and after assuring the hostess that they never had had so lovely a time before, Lotus Blossom and Toyo make two deep bows, and return home very happy. I believe you would not object to a party like that yourself, would you? Among all the joyous festivals of the year, I must not forget to tell you of the plum shearing. The winter season is very short in Japan, and the houses are not built to keep out the cold very well, as you must have already perceived. When the spring days arrive, and the blossoms begin to appear, the child people are very happy. If they are happy, of course, they must show it. How can they do it so well as by having outdoor picnics in the plum orchards? The children watch for the great day's arrival when the flowers will be in full bloom. They save up the yen to spend and plan for a great good time. No school on that day. No practicing on the koto. No embroidery for lotus blossom. Everyone is up early on the bright, clear morning and baskets are filled with the nice luncheon Mama has prepared. There's actually an air of excitement in the quiet Japanese household. The good father leads the family procession as they start out on their walk to the picnic grounds. It is about two miles from their home. Other families join them as they walk along. The throng of gaily dressed and happy people grows larger every moment. As they near the plum orchard, they find the road lined with stands, which have been put up for the day. It seems as though everything one could desire were on sale. Cakes, tea, fruit, fans, sweets of all kinds, toys, etc. No wonder Lotus Blossom and Toyo wanted to save up the money. 
but the orchard was there ever a lovelier sight hundreds of trees loaded with fragrant pink blossoms the people write poems about them and pin them on the branches to show how much they appreciate the beautiful sight which nature has given them tea drinking story telling and the entertainments of travelling showmen take up the day sunset bids them leave the beautiful scene and go back to home and work and now children we must bid these dear cousins good-bye for a little while although they worship in strange ways and read their books upside down besides doing many other things in a manner that seems strange to us yet we can learn much from their simple childlike natures and after all isn't one reason why we live in this big world and are so different one from another that we may learn from each other end of part six end of our little japanese cousin by mary hazelton blanchard wade recording by yula niedermeyer